The Lord is a stronghold. 
stronghold for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble, and those who know your word, your name. And those who know your name put their trust in you. For you, O oh Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Sing praises to the Lord who dwells in Zion. Tell among the people his deeds. For he who avenges blood is mindful of them. He does not forget the cry of the afflicted. Be gracious to me, O oh Lord. Behold what I suffer from those who hate me. O oh, you who lifteth me up from the gates of death, that I may recount all of your praises, that in the gates of the daughter of Zion I may rejoice in your deliverance. The nations have sunk in the pit which they made themselves, in the net which they hid as their own foot been caught. The Lord has made himself known, he has executed judgment. The wicked are snared in the work of their own hands. The wicked shall depart to Sheol, all the nations that forgot that forget God. For the needy shall not always be forgotten, and the hope of the poor shall not perish forever. Arise, O Lord, let not mankind prevail. Let the nations be judged before you. Put them in fear, O Lord, that the nations know that they are but people. This ends the Old Testament lesson. Let us move now to the reading in the New Testament, in the 22nd chapter of Matthew's Gospel. Now, to truly get a grasp of what Jesus is talking about here, and to know the situation let me put a little of this into context with this passage. In verse 1 of chapter 21 are the familiar words where Jesus sends his disciples into Jerusalem as they come to celebrate the day of Pentecost, a Jewish celebration, one that goes way back to the most. So Jesus has sent his disciples to him to get a donkey for him to ride on. Then he enters the city, the people proclaim him to be a great prophet. Jesus goes to the temple, and there he encounters the money changers, and I think a lot of us know that story. And sitting on the sidelines in all of this, sitting on the sidelines are the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the other leaders of the people. And they are watching very carefully all of this. And Jesus then, as you continue reading chapter 21 and the first part of uh, chapter 21, Jesus goes into the temple and he teaches and he heals. And now we get to chapter 22. And Chapter 22, what we will read goes down to verse 14. But the context of this whole event goes through the end of chapter 23. So if you want to really get a feel for what Jesus was encountering that day, you need to read 21, 22, and 23. Okay, so chapter 22, beginning with verse 1. Hear the word of God. And again, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a marriage feast for his son and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the marriage feast. But they would not come. Again, the king sent other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, Behold, I have made ready my dinner, my oxen and my pack, calves are killed, and everything is ready. Come to the marriage feast. But they, the people, made light of what the king had invited them for, and went off, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized the king's servant, 
treated him shamefully and killed him. The king was angry, and he sent his troops to destroy those murderers and burn their city. Then the king said to his servants, The wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy to come. Go therefore to the thoroughfares and invite the marriage and invite to the marriage feast as many people as you find. And the servants went out into the streets and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came and went to the wedding hall to look at the guests, he saw there was a person there who had a no wedding garment. And he said to the man, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And the man was speechless. Then the king said to the man, uh, to his attendants, Find him hand and foot, and cast him into the outer darkness, where people will weep and gnash their teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. This ends the scripture reading for the day. May God continue to bless his word and guide us as we respond to faith. Well, Jesus told this parable at a big celebration for the people in his community in their day of time. But, you know, here in the 21st century, we know what celebrations are, don't we? The month of June and a lot of the summer is a time of celebration for us modern 21st century Americans, isn't it? Celebrations. Ah, graduating from high school or college, or nowadays it's getting, it's getting middle school and elementary school. In the neighborhood in which we live, there was one family who had for two weeks a big sign in front of their house on their picture window that said, graduation from middle school. Celebration. What other celebrations occur this time of year besides the 4th of July? Weddings. And graduation from college. And yes, even in the summer months, there can be promotions at work, or maybe even a change in structure at work, where the old boss is gone and the new one comes, and isn't that a time of celebration? So we know what celebrations are in the 21st century. It's just like they knew what they were in Jesus' day and time. What are celebrations? What do we look for when we do celebration? Joy, a, a joyous time, a time to be with friends, a time to have fun, and I will not leave out a time to have food. So these are fun times they cause excitement in celebration. Today and way back then also. So, now, hopefully, we have a feeling for the meaning of this parable that Jesus told. What happened in the parable? The father of the son invited people, his friends, his culture friends, his buddies that he'd grown up with, his peers, he invited them to come to the marriage feast of his son. The meaning of the parable here is God, our Creator, the Heavenly Father, has called all of humanity, all of mankind, throughout the centuries to come together as his people, and to look forward to that feast, which Jesus described as feast, which is the kingdom of God eternally in heaven. We cannot grasp or understand it in this life, but we are given the fact that it will occur 
we can only receive it on faith. And that's what Jesus is talking about here. Is that in his day and time, certain leaders of the people and certain other people too, which were less significant people in the community, ignored the invitation. We have people today that ignore the invitation to eternal life. So, the king in the parable rightfully got angry, didn't he? After all, he had spent a ton of money getting ready for the celebration. And he was ready to treat all of the people to this joyous event, but they turned him down. They snubbed their noses at him and walked away and found excuses not to come. So the scripture tells us that Jesus said to his servants, go out amongst all of the lonely people, the good and bad, the healthy and the sick, the good looking and the not so good looking. And have them come, invite them to come to this wedding feast. It's for them, not those people who don't want it. So they went out, the servants did, and they came back in with the mob, an everyday crowd of people, rich and poor, smart and not so smart. People with wisdom and people that didn't have good judgment. People with all kinds of help. And there was the wedding feast for them. And they joyfully had a good time and shared life with one another. And the king got to the point where he was maybe watching this group have a good time together. And he said, I want to be part of it. So he walked in and began to greet people and came across a person who was not dressed appropriately. Now that's important. We don't really know why this person was not dressed appropriately. But apparently everybody else in the room had taken time to wash their face perhaps or to change shirts, or to turn a shirt, or, or a robe as they wore back in those days, to turn it inside out so at least it looked clean. And yet there was one person there who was not that way. And the king walked over to that person and said, why have you not done something to dress appropriately for this grand occasion? And the person was speechless. Couldn't say a thing. He had no excuses. He knew he was caught. And the king threw him out. Doesn't that happen still today in our relationship with God? Aren't there people rich and poor, smart and ignorant, pretty and not pretty, sick and healthy, good and bad? Aren't there all kinds of people who today come joyfully looking for the festive festival that God is going to put on when the trials and tribulations of this life are over. And yet, don't you know some people who say, oh, I'm a Christian. I don't have time to go to church on Sunday. I believe. I don't have time to pray, but I'm a Christian. I'm going to heaven with everybody else. We have those, uh, we have people in this day and time, and I bet you know a few of them, who, as Jesus said in the parable, don't dress appropriately. The parable was good for his day and time. It continues to be good in our day and time. The scripture 
points out that in that crowd around Jesus that day were the religious and the political leaders of the community, the state, the nation. And not only were those people there, the opposers, the opposition to Jesus, but there were also ordinary people like us, all of us. There were ordinary people who had seen Jesus do his miracles, healing people, who had heard Jesus teach, and had seen Jesus' entire personality. And so had all the religious and political people of the day, because Jesus was very public. He didn't make a big deal out of it. He just moved quietly and gently amongst the people, sharing the Father, the Heavenly Father, with you of the fact that we are all welcome to that joyous banquet of eternal life, the one we go to on faith. Well, which one of these three characters are you and I? Are we the ones who turn up our nose and walk away because we're too proud, because we've got the answer to all of the human problems? Or we don't have time to deal with that person because I don't like that person? Or are we one of those people who claim that they are a follower of Jesus Christ, but they don't live it because they are busy saying, I'm going to believe as a Christian what I want to believe. I don't have time to read the Bible. It's a hard book to understand anyway. It's not much fun. Besides that, I pray every once in a while when I go to church, if I make it to church, because, you know, there may be something else I want to do that's more fun with my faith. Or are we those people who say, you know, God of creation, somehow, for some reason, place me here. And the God of creation that can do that, who is proud of human life and human beings, because we are his highest form of creation. And when we were created, we were created when God called us in Genesis. Look back there at the creation story. People who were created were not good like everything else in creation. God pronounced people very good. And God has worked hard down through the time to make it possible so that he could accept us into his kingdom. And that last verse in the scripture we read, that scary verse, verse 14, of verse 13. Oh no, it's 14. Verse 14, listen to it again. For many are called, but few are chosen. Many are called, but few are chosen. Consider the parable. The ones who were not chosen, even though they were called, were the ones who rejected a relationship with God the Father. They were the ones who tried to control their relationship to God the Father. All of those people who wanted a relationship with the Creator, God the Father, were chosen and permitted 
to remain in the joy of passion. So examine your life. You're the one who decides how you will respond in your relationship to our Heavenly Father and His Son and the Holy Spirit leading us all. Do you need to improve your prayer life? Do you even need just generally to improve your relationship to God, the Father, to show God respect, to think about God from time to time and stand in amazement at what God has done in all of this creation? Consider God's son Jesus, the man of Nazareth, who was God walking amongst humanity and was willing to give of his life and die so that our sins might be forgiven. If only honestly and humbly and sincerely we would turn to him in prayers asking for forgiveness. Do we strive to look at the Bible and try to learn from it and to improve our lives in relationship to our knowledge and understanding of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? Do we live in the example of Jesus of Nazareth where we care for the people around us and strive to help them in difficult times and in good times in You know, Jesus was asked, what are the great commandments? He said, the first and second commandments are two, are to love God the Father with your whole being and your neighbor as yourself. This church is an instrument, is a gift of God, given to humanity who want to follow Him. The church this? is made of people who gather to worship God, to encourage one another to worship God, to work together, to share their abilities, their talents, and resources, to help others in the world. You know, Piedmont Presbyterian Church does a marvelous job in what you do as mission in the community and around the world. And if you think about that, could any one of us on our own do better than what we as the church do? as instruments of God's love in the world. So that's what Jesus' parable back then was about. And that's what it's about today. A reminder that the God, the Heavenly Father, the Creator of all that exists, everything we see in this gift of light and love in this sinful world that we create, sinful world. That this God continues to reach down and invite all of us people, regardless of who we are, we are invited to maintain faith, knowing that God loves us in spite of our pain. And everybody has these aches and pains, or we soon will, okay? As part of this life of sin. sin. Look forward to that life which is to come, to the great type, to the great marriage feast, to the great time eternally with the God who is beyond our imagination. Let us pray. Thank you, O God, our Heavenly Father, for sending your only Son. Good.